And keeping this in mind, there, there are two major categories of nasal obstruction that I like to think about. Um, these are the variable structures and the fixed structures of the nose. The variable structures are essentially related to the lining of the nose. So we talked about the bone and the cartilage that's inside uh, the nose. Um, there's actually a lining of mucosa, which is outlined here. I drew it here in red. Uh, and this is, by the way, a cross section through the nose. So this is the nasal bridge. This is the bottom, uh, as if you're looking up someone's nose and they're laying flat. And uh, this is the septum here and the lateral sidewall here. This lining here, when we get a cold or we have allergies, becomes thickened. And very small changes, as I mentioned, in that radius can make a big difference in the, your ability to breathe through the nose. With allergies and other things, the, this thickness can vary. And so this is a variable structure. Um, so when, you're, when we talk to patients, so we ask them about their history of allergy uh, disease, uh, allergic or non-allergic rhinitis, sinus disease. Uh, we look in the nose, we see if there's evidence of swelling or other telltale signs of allergic disease. And um, the other major category of uh, nasal obstruction would be fixed obstructions. These are things that don't change. Fixed structures include the septum, uh, the upper lateral cartilage, this angle up here, we call this angle up here the internal valve area, which we'll be talking about more in a little bit. The size of this turbinate bone, uh, which doesn't change. All the things underneath that mucosa. And um, when we talk to patients, we ask about a history of trauma. Sometimes there's no history of trauma. Things can just be bent out of shape anyway. Uh, the laterality of symptoms, whether one side is constantly obstructed and doesn't change, that's a sign that it's not something that's variable. Um, and we look inside the nose at the septum, these turbinates, which are these things on the sides here, and the internal and external valve, which I'll explain a little bit more in just a bit. Now, this sort of dichotomy of, uh, of variable structures and fixed structures provides um, also a management uh, mechanism. And basically, when there are problems with the variable structures, the mucosa, in other words, we generally treat folks uh, with medical therapy. And that's usually our first line anyway. We don't want to go straight to the knife. And uh, nasal steroid sprays, which are now quite common and quite safe, uh, even in pediatric populations, can have a really nice effect in terms of reducing the swelling of that mucosa. And histamine therapy, which is now largely over the counter, and ultimately, if allergies are an issue, immunotherapy. The second line, of course, would then be treatment of the fixed structures. Folks who have failed medical treatment or have strong evidence for a fixed obstruction are not going to respond to medicines very well. And in this case, there may be a surgical procedure which can be done to alter the, the structure of the nose such that airflow is improved. And this is a, a septoplasty or other types of functional rhinoplasty maneuvers. And you know, functional rhinoplasty is in and of itself a, a large topic, but I thought I'd break it down into a few different areas based on the anatomy. And um, uh, we talked about some of those fixed structures, and the first one is the septum. We've probably all heard of people having a septoplasty or septal surgery or a septal deviation, and uh, let's talk about that first. If we take a cross-section uh, sideways through the skull, and this is a, a cartoon diagram of that, this is what the septum may look like. So this is the, uh, the dorsum of the nose, the bridge of the nose up here, uh, and the nostril where we breathe in air was right is right down here. And this cutaway uh, section of the skull shows where the septum would be, which is primarily cartilage in this front portion here and has bones in back which are thin, but all of this supports the structure of the nose. In a septal deviation, this septum will be coming out of the page or out of the screen or away from the screen and blocking the nasal airway on one or both sides. Septal deviations in and of themselves are not uncommon. So if we took 100 people off the street, we may find septal deviations in many of them. But a septal deviation that causes nasal obstruction uh, and correlates with a nasal obstruction is an indication perhaps to have a surgery, not just a septal deviation in and of itself. When we do septal surgery, we can actually remove some of that bone and cartilage safely uh, without any change in the structure of the nose, as long as we preserve a strut of bone and cartilage that supports this part out here externally. Sometimes we can actually do some things to the, uh, the cartilage up in the front here to manipulate it, to make it go in or out, or, or make it straighter. But by and large, most septoplasty surgery, which is an outpatient surgery, involves something like this. And so what is a septoplasty? Uh, it's an outpatient surgery with incisions only on the inside of the nose. 
Um, and in this case, we remove or manipulate the septal cartilage or bone to get it straighter and improve that nasal airway. There are no intended changes in the external nasal appearance. I can't tell you how many times I have folks who come to me who, um, who say they've had a septoplasty and nothing else done, but of course they've had, really had a, a rhinoplasty. I think that was more commonly done in the 70s and 80s and not so much anymore, um, but uh, that is often the case. But there are some times when the septum is so deviated that there's an obvious external deformity. And this is an example of, of one of my patients uh, uh, who, who had a very severe uh, septal deviation due to trauma as a child and the septum grew in in the wrong direction. Uh, in this case, you can see that there's flattening of the nose in the central area and on the side view, there's what we call a saddle here because the septum is about about 80 or 90 degrees away from the direction it's supposed to be going. It's literally blocking both sides of her nose. She's not so concerned about the external appearance, although she wouldn't mind it being better. She really just wants to be able to breathe. She has essentially no uh, nasal airway uh, on the left side and a partial on the right. And this is a, it just sort of a close-up view showing that this red line is the, where that septum's going. Where the bones are, it's straight, but when it comes out to the cartilaginous portion, it's waving all the way off towards the right and then back towards the midline. This is a challenge that a standard septoplasty wouldn't be able to address. As I mentioned earlier, we preserve generally the strut of cartilage and bone across here in order to support that nose, but hers is twisted up here in the front, so how do we go about fixing that? And um, we actually, uh, I published a, a paper describing a technique where we actually remove this entire cartilage uh, and take a straight portion of it and reconstruct the nose by placing a part of it back in there. Now this is not done with a standard septoplasty approach, it's done with a, a more of a functional rhinoplasty approach, so it doesn't count as a regular septoplasty. But with this we can actually correct very severe deviations of the septum. This is a, a more of a cartoon diagram demonstrating this, where we keep this dorsal strut, which means up top here, of uh, cartilage, and replace a portion of the cartilage down below with a piece from in back that's straight and support the nasal tip and preserve the nasal form and also improve uh, the nasal airway at the same time. This is uh, the only bloody photo I'll be showing, but um, this uh, shows uh, this septum coming out here. The skin's been retracted on the nose, and this shows a severe deviation of the septum. Um, it doesn't look as severe once we get it out here, but this is out on the operating table. And then by placing it back in, that wasn't the same patient, by the way, um, we actually do get some change in the aesthetic appearance of the nose, which is not the intention of the surgery, uh, but just by replacing that cartilage in the appropriate position, we do get that. And, you know, she's actually somewhat straighter on her frontal view. This is about a year after surgery, not perfectly straight, which brings up a good point about uh, crooked nose surgery. Um, we'll be talking about that specifically later, but in cases of severe deviations, it's really not likely that things are going to be perfectly straight afterwards, and I, I make that pretty clear uh, to my patients, but um, uh, she uh, actually did very well. Most importantly, she could breathe very well. <laughs>